what are the building blocks given your experience to, to build a vibrant capital market? Why capital markets are needed in Ethiopia. But I want to take a step back and provide a bit of uh, context. So Ethiopia today, we have a population of about 110 million people. By 2050, the population will be 214 uh, people. That's what I see the estimates. And a very young population, average age 19.5 years. Secondly, if you look at urbanization, uh, we are at 21%, 21.3% to be precise. By 2050, the urban population in Ethiopia will be nearly 40%. So what does that mean in terms of uh, trends? Agriculture is big in this country, employing 75% of the people, but with that urbanization uh, trend, what does that mean? Climate change is big. Uh, I think the estimate is that by 2050, maybe temperatures, mean temperatures will rise between 1.5 to 3 degrees. It means there's going to be a very significant stress on the economy and the, on agriculture, how we practice that. So when you put all these things in context, it basically means that uh, we have to mobilize huge amounts of resources for investment, to create jobs, to improve economic outcomes for the young people who are going to be coming to the market and all that. And if you're looking at the urbanization, of course, we're going to need a lot of investment in uh, housing, in urban infrastructure and things like that. So Dr. Brooke, um, Hannah, and also uh, Sirak and uh, Tilahun mentioned about the need for financing. So I won't talk too much about that, but I'll use two examples just to illustrate that point. But as we develop the economy, of course the state has had a very strong uh, role and which has been very appreciated, but we now need the private sector to, step, to start stepping in. So if the private sector is going to play a meaningful role, we need a financial sector that is going to be robust and uh, supportive. You can't have a financial sector without the capital market. Today it's mostly banks, but we also need to diversify the financial sector and include the capital market so that you can have two engines. You know, it's like uh, flying an, uh, an aeroplane with one engine. So you need two of them so that uh, we can have you know, further growth and all that. So diversification of the financial sector is important. Of course, the need to finance the development that I talked about is good, and I'll give two examples on that. There is a third dimension which sometimes we don't talk about, which is around risk management. Sometimes I call it the original sin. Uh, the original sin in our space basically means uh, two things. One is, and there are two of them, two of them. One of them is what we call the currency risk. If you are generating cash flows in uh, beer and you're financing yourself in dollars, and the dollar is appreciating every day, that is a recipe for disaster. So you need to develop a local currency market as well. Second one is uh, what you call tenor. You are building a house and you're using your credit card to build your house. It's another recipe for disaster. So you need instruments in the market that can provide long-term financing to meet the kind of assets that you are being uh, generated and investing. Now, let me talk about uh, something else which um, uh, I think uh, Ato Sirak mentioned about, which is about intermediaries. Obviously, if you have a market, a lot of us in this room will have an opportunity to earn an income by providing services to the capital market, by being a broker, by being a dealer, by being an investment banker, by being a custodian. Those, that's another ecosystem that is going to be created, which is, which is great. Now, let me just highlight then the two examples that I wanted to use while capital markets are very much needed in Ethiopia. The first one I'm going to look at the urbanization. I talked about that urbanization, 21% to 40%. What does that mean? In 2021, FSD Africa undertook a study called Financing the Urban Opportunity in Africa. We looked at that five cities. Those cities included a number of cities in Ethiopia. And for Ethiopia-specific uh, investment requirements, we identified investment needs of about $90 billion between 2021 or 2022 to 2050, that's cumulatively, $90 billion. That is investment capital that is needed that will be raised from the market, partly of that. But it is going to generate economic opportunity of about $240 billion. So you can imagine the impact on the economy and create about 210,000 jobs. So that's just one example of how the market, capital markets can be mobilized, can be used to support a need, a trend that is uh, required in the market here. 
Let me talk about the second example. And again, there's a study that hopefully will be risen soon with FSD Ethiopia. Uh, 2022, we undertook a study on uh, climate finance flows for Ethiopia. That was just before the COP27 in uh, Sharm el Sheikh. And we looked at the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions for Ethiopia. The investment need for that, that was identified between now and 2030 on a over 10 year period was $316 billion. The split between what you call adaptation and mitigation is 13% uh, to 87%. So the bulk of that is mitigation, reducing carbon emission or moving us to a path of low carbon emissions. That's about investment. It's about building infrastructure that is clean. So you are looking at uh, clean uh, urban transportation like the right rail, electric rail. It's about building the hydro dams. It's about solar. It's about wind. It's about buildings as well. Building, having houses or buildings that are climate smart. So it cuts and it's about agriculture as well. So it cuts across very, very many sectors. So that is an investment opportunity. By year, it's $27.2 billion. That's what is needed uh, collectively. And about that, $6.3 billion is to come from the domestic resources and all that. Capital market can play a role in uh, you know, bridging that financing gap. And I was very excited when Tila Hoon was uh, presenting and he mentioned green bonds. So I said, wow, that is really good. So the market already is thinking ahead on uh, providing uh, instruments for that. Now, the role of the capital markets, I won't, that has been mentioned. So let me just mention three quick things. We talked about capital, capital mobilization, so accumulating capital. And then once we accumulate that capital, we talk about allocating the capital to where it is needed most. Identifying opportunities that will be successful and shunning those ones that will not be successful. The capital market is very efficient in allocating resources. For companies that are trying to raise money, for corporates that are trying to raise either equity or debt for investment, for government, for municipalities and all that. Capital markets are very efficient in allocating that capital. And then finally, just to mention that capital markets are also very good in providing a signaling effect to policymakers. If the market is up and running ECX, the index is moving up and it's moving down because of uh, maybe a government policy that is coming down, is coming out. That's a very strong signal whether the, the public sector is actually moving in the right direction as well. Now, in terms of the building blocks for the market, and there's been a lot of discussion this morning about that, I'll just mention maybe four quick areas very quickly. First one, of course, is that we need a very orderly market. When you talk about an orderly market, we also mean the legal regulatory environment has to be good and promote transparency, fairness, and, and all that. And I think the Ethiopian Capital Markets Authority is doing a great job on the proclamation, on the directives that are coming through, that are being built on world-class standards because they are being benchmarked on IOSCO, they're being benchmarked on a number of countries that are similar to Ethiopia, and they are being contextualized to the Ethiopian environment. So that is very good. So there's a very good foundation. The second one as a foundation is around market infrastructure. Market infrastructure, there are two significant uh, pieces. We talked about the, capital, the securities exchange, ECX. We call that the trading platform. And more importantly, we also have the post-trade information. Once you trade, how does that trade clear and settle? How do the securities and cash move from the buyers and sellers in an efficient, an orderly manner, in a cost-effective manner, and in a secure manner. That is the clearing and settlement and the deposit. That's a function, and uh, we are happy that uh, there's progress uh, in, that, in that space as well. And then finally, not finally, but uh, two is, uh, you can't have a market if you don't need, you don't have people who need the capital, yeah? So having bankable projects, companies that are ready and prepared to adhere to very high corporate governance standards is very, very critical because the deal for the capital markets, I normally say, is you have lighter, you have lighter requirements in terms of collateral. You know, if you go to the bank, the bank will say, yes, I like your idea, but what kind of asset do you have that I can sell in case you didn't pay me? Yeah? But for the capital markets, it's different. What you do is uh, they will not require a lot of the collateral requirement, but they'll say, can you be transparent to me? Disclose so that I can be able to monitor your business and understand whether you can repay uh, repay if it's a debt, repay the, the principal or the interest, and 
if it's equity, give me a good return on the investment and all that. So disclose it at the beginning and then disclose continually so that I can be able to monitor that. So that is the, that is the whole um, purpose of that. And I think their, the role of uh, the accounting bodies and all that is going to be very critical. The corporate governance is going to be very critical as well. Then you can't have a market without investors. And uh, when you look at the investors, diversification is very important or broadening the investor base is important. That is an area where we need to do a lot of work here in Ethiopia, starting with the domestic, uh, mobilizing retail, the retail investor base that is very strong here into collective investment schemes and other specialized vehicles so that those funds can be managed in a very professional manner. But also over time as the market matures and as financial liberalization continues, also start attracting international investors. That probably will come at a later stage. And then finally, there is the role of the intermediaries. And I think that's where most of us are here. Because the intermediaries play a very important role of connecting the pools of capital that exist in the market to where that capital is needed uh, most. And uh, they say that prof intermediaries who come to the market need to be very professional, as uh, Sirak was telling us. And they have to be competent as well so that they can be able to connect. As the Ethiopia Capital Market Authority, the regulator, the NBE is enhancing their capacity, I could also encourage uh, intermediaries to also enhance their capacity so that the, market, the public sector or the regulators are not very far ahead of the market. Some, sometimes that's a, a kind of a risk. I've, I don't know, maybe that's I could stop there and uh, I can elaborate yes, a little bit we'll, more. We'll, yeah. we'll come yeah. back. Thank you, Dan, thank you, Dr. Evans. I think um, uh, in terms of the, 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 the relevance of the capital market, I think key takeaways, um, the, the accumulation of capital, the allocation, providing signal, all those important things. Then in terms of the intermediaries, being uh, thinking about corporate governance, uh, transparency, disclosure, all these key elements. So thank, thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, what was uh, the sort of the benchmarks you've looked at as, as, as we get uh, the, the work of the Capital Market Authority underway? We don't necessarily look at a benchmark in a vacuum. Um, there's a progression, essentially, as to how we're trying to build um, the regulatory framework. Uh, essentially, again, um, we start from the IOSCO principles because that in and of itself is a benchmark. It is the international best practices you know, accumulated from um, what all the other regulators have uh, um, learned. So we take that as a starting point, and then looking at specific benchmarks, um, you know, we look to see, uh, you know, countries that are similarly profiled, or countries that are um, arranged. Their legal arrangement is very similar to ours, or their or their experiences are very similar to ours. So um, it can run the gamut. It could be uh, different countries for different types of directives. Uh, obviously, we, uh, we look to our neighbors first. Um, we're most similar with them. So we've looked at other African countries, uh, Kenya, obviously, Nigeria. I mean, and for certain elements, we might even look at you know, a, a Zambian provision uh, to see how that was written. Um, then we look at um, other countries, such as Malaysia, for example. So Malaysia is very far ahead in um, Islamic finance. So when we're looking at uh, certain elements as to how to incorporate um, Sharia provisions, say, within, within a directive, uh, we might look to uh, Malaysia. But obviously, all of that taken together, we have to make it specific for Ethiopia. Now, the importance of taking IOSCO and also making it similar to other countries is that it, it sets the foundation for inviting other people, uh, and it also sets the foundation of expanding the participation. So we, we want to have a wide range of participants. So, um, so to answer your question, <laughs> uh, several countries is, are the benchmark. What do you think are the best practices and key learnings? And also, you know, especially when we're, we're starting, so the, the, our capital market authority is on a startup mode, the security exchanges on a startup mode, the whole ecosystem is on the startup mode. So what are, you know, what are the key regulatory considerations at this early stage of a capital market establishment? Paul. Uh, but in terms of where I felt we had some best practices in Kenya, uh, first and foremost, I'd build that around the work we did to put in place our Capital Markets Master Plan, which is a 10-year strategy document involving all stakeholders, really identifying what are the key goals we're pursuing, 
and then breaking down uh, responsibility and allocating accountability um, for delivery of the different pillars of that um, so that uh, consistently we felt that there was a cross-sectoral uh, commitment to working together towards a common outcome rather than every institution uh, working to their own priority uh, rating. Um, I think second to that was, you know, as you discuss um, what are the key priorities and the key goals being pursued, it then becomes so critical to make sure that you're prioritizing uh, capacity building in education um, so that you, on the institutional side, you have people able to, as it were, talk the same language and have the uh, similar reference points. And, then, and more so, as you're looking at um, priorities to be accelerated and initiatives to be catalyzed, you have a level of a commonality of what people are applying their resources and efforts to. Uh, but just the same um, on the investor side. You need the investors to know, really understand what are the true opportunities. And when you talk of the capital markets, that they stop seeing those as the solution for those other people and start better understanding them at corporate level and individual level as a tool for us to deliver value for ourselves and achieve our own um, outlooks and mandates. Now, um, as you do that as an authority, I think it then becomes so critical um, to build a great deal of internal uh, capacity. Um, and really, the, as you talk about um, ECMA really being at a startup point, how do you make sure that you build a roadmap to have the right boots on the ground and really the, the right level of um, capacity and engagement to really drive the work that's necessary in so many areas simultaneously. When you're starting a market, there are very, very, very many moving parts. And what you tend to find is if you don't have appropriate resources available to drive those, things aren't moving. And you are exhausted because you're working so hard. But because if you have, let's say, six uh, running lines, if one of them is not working, the other five cannot deliver their outcomes. So you're exhausted. You've worked on five things, but you have no outcome. So really making sure that you have the right pool of resources available and making sure there's appropriate alignment and accountability internally of who owns what and who's accountable for delivery of what within what, what timelines. Um, I think I would, it, it's, especially this being an industry conversation, the next one tends to be sensitive, uh, but really making sure that there's timely, consistent, and impactful enforcement is so, so critical. Markets are really built around confidence and clarity of action. And the more consistent you are in the types of issues that are investigated, uh, the types of matters that enforcement action is taken, and really a level playing field on how sanctions are imposed, irrespective of who you are. Uh, there is, is an understanding that there is consequences that are consistently applied to outliers. You will then find the market much more realistically, despite their own kind of institutional and individual interests, working in a common direction, because you all know what the consequences of uh, not moving that direction are. Um, uh, another key pillar where we're able to really leverage value from the markets was really prioritizing around uh, corporate governance and transparency, very much in line with what um, Evans has put out, that unless you have an appropriate level of disclosure and transparency, it then becomes very difficult to even deal with issues around price determination and the timing of when you will or will not buy in or sell a particular security. So that level of transparency is critical to building the right foundations on which the, the market can grow. And in Kenya, we really approach that at two levels. At the issuer level, we put in place very clear corporate governance standards that they're doing self-evaluations against and then being graded. So every year, you know the grading of those in terms of who are complying, not complying, where they're struggling, where they're not struggling. 
But at the same time, we also put in place an, uh, a, a stewardship code so that we're also empowering the investment investor community uh, to vote with their feet. Uh, that in terms of with the clarity and transparency being made available, you then get to um, usher um, companies to move in one direction or another based on expectations around that uh, transparency and um, uh, effective pricing. Now, the final point I, I just want to put out was um, given the very simple realities of as a continent, we have, as it were, the, the biggest price to pay with climate change, with the lowest contribution <laughs> uh, to this problem. Um, I, I think it really did operate, open up a lot of work we tried to do on really creating the right kind of environment to um, allow for market-based financing around green finance and meaningful transition. And when we talk of transition, I think we need to really, as a continent, better understand that the net zero transition is not a cost and is not something that is re reducing our opportunities to ride on in the direction others went in. It is actually opening up a whole new opportunity for us. And uh, I hate to say it, but when you look at overall the general level of low development we have on the continent is finally serving as a huge opportunity for us because we don't have huge transition costs. We don't have very high levels of um, idle assets. We need to retire and build new things. We get to build the right thing, the right way, in a sustainable way. And really, when we look at the realities we have of just unemployment on our continent, um, how do we have a huge pool of um, employable resources that can be deployed in the right area with minor trading, because uh, as a continent, we're very well educated. But just pointing people in the right direction, and you're not incurring costs of um, moving people from what they have been doing for years. Because we have a low pop population, they're starting something new, you point them in the right direction, new sectors, new directions, be it in energy, uh, be it in uh, carbon credit ge generation uh, and extraction areas that there are huge opportunities for us. So we need to live by it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, really interesting. So for the intermediaries, I would, I would take away um, some, some of uh, Paul's key messaging in terms of investing on capacity building, uh, training, um, investing on your corporate governance, uh, thinking about uh, transparency, disclosures, um, given the, the Kenyan experience, all those important points. Uh, I think there's also a message for the Capital Market Authority in terms of having timely and consistent enforcement, leveling, uh, level playing field for all, um, and, and doing it the right way. So a really interesting uh, insight there. Thank you, Paul. And, and also, I think if there are any entrepreneurs, think about uh, what Paul said about self-evaluation tools. So these self-evaluation tools could be innovated in so many ways and can be trained on uh, from, from, from early start, from early stage. So this is also uh, an important takeaway. So, so thank you, Paul. So maybe I move to um, Dr. Tilahun. So, you know, so Dr. Tilahun, you talked about the role of the Ethiopian Security Exchange earlier. Um, so just for clarity uh, and for some of our audiences here, if we can be absolutely blunt on the relationship between the Ethiopian Security Exchange and the Capital Market Authority. How can you outline that? And also, in terms of how do you think, you know, you know, you were asking or you were suggesting or implying that you'll be coming back here asking for money. So <laughs> you, you need to start to sell your idea. What, what is ESX going to do for Ethiopia? How is that going to contribute uh, for Ethiopia's economy? Dr. Talon. Thank you. Uh, the, perhaps the reason why I laughed if you, if you were looking at me was the only question that he, he indicated that we'd be asking me before was, you know, differentiate between the ESX and CMA. Uh, I think, you know, the, perhaps not to insult your intelligence, maybe the room already understands what the Capital Market Authority and the market does. Uh, so we're literally 
a private entity, a market facilitator, market organizer, and will be regulated by the Capital Markets Authority. In fact, one of the few directives that will be coming out in the next few weeks would be perhaps the licensing directives for us. Um, so, yeah, that's the distinction. So we'll be uh, regulated by the, uh, by the Capital Markets Authority. In terms of our role uh, and perhaps our sales pitch uh, is, uh, let me just say, I think the, the next time we'll have a workshop like this, the, our probably the investors and the issuers will be in the front row, uh, followed by <laughs> our shareholders and, and, and things like that. So the, the idea is, uh, I think for us, uh, uh, we, we, we want to play at least two primary roles. Uh, and if I would emphasize, I would rather emphasize today a uh, role in the data market. Uh, the idea would be, you know, eventually would be, you know, asking ourselves about, you know, um, who is investing in the data market and, and where is the liquidity coming from. Uh, we'll be asking questions about inflation, this and that. I think eventually we're very happy if we contribute uh, in one way or another, uh, to government's agenda in terms of uh, being able to finance its budget deficit through market methods and through us. Uh, and if we actually create a certain level of liquidity there, uh, we'd, be, we'd be very very much satisfied. And I think in that process, we'd be raising revenue. Uh, and we expect also a significant part of our revenue to come from that date market. So in that, in that sense, then, we expect uh, both the banks, uh, other financial institutions and the intermediaries to be investors in the exchange because eventually we'll be serving uh, ourselves, uh, uh, I think less level, uh, uh, reducing inflation by 5%, 10%, et cetera, would be, would be beneficial for the banks and for us uh, more, than, more, than, uh, more than anyone else. So that's actually the, our critical infrastructure role. Um, I think if I would mention that process, I think we, we have, uh, onboarded a financial advisor, we're going through our uh, uh, financial model and will be coming out uh, primarily targeting uh, our domestic uh, financial institutions uh, to be onboarded and, and own the exchange and, 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 that's, and then some of the stakeholders. And if, if not it's respect, I would say then now put, put your money where your mouth is in terms of until today we've been conversing. Our, I mean, if you actually, I would suggest, you know, if you actually go to have a look at the last medium-term debt management strategy from the government, Minister of Finance, it's on, on the website. You will see that government has always planned to say, you know, how do I finance myself? Primarily domestic uh, uh, instruments, domestic debt, then go, you know, external debt and et cetera, et cetera. But it has always been deprioritized because there was no capital market, there was no more exchange, private sector participation was low. So we went back to all the th perhaps third option, fourth option, uh, for the past consecutive three or four debt management strategies. I think as they go in revising that debt management strategy, the last one ended in 2021. Uh, the idea would be, okay, now priority would be uh, raise, raise our, our resources from the domestic debt market. I think, so that's the key sales speech. Uh, second, I think in the equity, in the equity uh, uh, side, the idea would be eventually use the existing instruments as a facet, you would say, uh, 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 the, the initial uh, seed to, to what could be a broader participation. So I think eventually at the, as a capital market authority and as an exchange, we would be measured uh, both by the level of you know, capital we, we facilitated and raised for the private sector as much as we did for the uh, uh, you know, public sector. And I think the idea there would be help uh, MSMEs help uh, uh, large corporates to actually be able to raise capital through, through our platform. And I think eventually the, the idea would be, of course, filling that gap that uh, Evans was alluding to, right? So what's the, you know, the job number, long-term capital number, and look at the homegrown economic reform, you know, find that number and see whether that, whether that gap is being filled by through market-based methods or, or I would say a non-market-based -market method. So the idea would be actually if we actually make a dent on that space, then we'd be a very successful exchange. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talon. I think uh, we, we, we would very much envy uh, the time when the, the market is there to start to allow a little bit of uh, a break on inflation. And so, so that's one, one, one of the key 
thing that we need so that the uh, large corporates can be um, uh, 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 vibrant and and and, and uh, uh, relevant to where we want to go take this economy to so um i think uh, maybe on on now that we've covered um the sort of the sec the, the ethiopia security exchange role maybe sirak I'll, I'll come to you um so 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 we've 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 seen um you know sort of what capital markets can do uh, dr evans covered that um uh, hannah covered in terms of our readiness uh, Talon talked about the esx platform from from again from the capital market authority perspective um what you know how how does the licensing um of um intermediaries is being planned at the moment uh, and um in terms of uh, what you see as the current potential for intermediaries, you know, if you if you can elaborate a little bit more on that. So I think the licensing process um, is just like I described earlier, is pretty straightforward. So once the directives go through the process of finalizing, then the market would know what the requirements are, and uh, obviously we start the licensing process aligned with. Uh, the market, right? So um, that would be forthcoming um, to everyone here. In terms of uh, just talking about what does, you know, who are the intermediaries, who, who on the ground can be, look forward to be licensing, providing these services. So at the coffee break, I was having a conversation with um, one of the vice presidents of the local banks. And uh, he was asking, you know, like, how would you suggest, like, what, how how can we participate? So, you know, in light of my earlier mention of, you know, structural kind of issues that the National Bank is working on, and once that is addressed, and we know, you know, the um, uh, retail banks can actually uh, create structures that work, that they can provide a lot of these services, you start with what kind of bank you are. If you're a bank with, uh, this bank happens to be, um, you know, have a lot of um, unions, co-ops as clients, so and as owners, actually. Okay, if that's the case, then you have this um, large pool of uh, who's, you know, if you look at who's uh, in the unions, a large pool of people are already uh, your clients. So how do you, then you need to come up with a plan that how can I use the capital market to serve, to uh, provide additional services to my existing clients. So I keep them and I over, you know, provide additional services and make, you know, obviously uh, make extra money. So you provide investment advice, you provide uh, brokerage. Uh, so currently, you know, we've talked about this earlier for a bit, the way, you know, shares are being traded today, the bank shares, the insurance company shares. Um, local brokers are, um, you know, posting uh, prices and interest on Telegram, WhatsApp groups, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook. So these kind of informal market already exists. Okay. So um, once, you know, there's a buyer and uh, seller connection made through the local brokers currently, the buyer and seller will go to the share office of, let's say, Hebrat Bank share office, and then they will sign an agreement. Um, Right, okay, so you know, buyer will pay this much for this many shares, and you know, I've agreed to transfer the shares. So that money is coming from a bank, and it's going to another bank. So if you're a bank, brokerage would be an ideal business. It's already going through your, you know, it's going through your accounts from one account to another. Make an extra 1%, 2% on that. Well, I mean, brokerage business would be ideal. Investment advice would be ideal for the I mean, but for the rest of the market, I think, you know, the idea is, you know, there are a lot of financial people here that are offering advisory services, various kind of financial services. So just look at your current business, business plan and see where you fit in. If you're a tech company, okay, some of the things that will be coming and you will see it on the directives, it's kind of a digital uh, sub broker for instance, somebody who can be 
between a broker and the investor so somebody can share, you know, trade um, their shares on the fork. So you can use your um, technology um, uh, background and expertise to provide that service. Um, so it, it depends on what you do. But I think at the end of the day, um, even though we don't have uh, capital market um, service providers kind of with expertise in capital markets, we do have a lot of expertise in financial markets. And this is, you know, I said it earlier, I mean, this market, the service provider space, it's I, I'm, the successful service providers, I believe, are gonna be Ethiopian-based companies because they know their customer, they've already in the business, and um, I think they have the ability to kind of line up the needs of customers and uh, the system to address those needs. If we do it right, if we get the capital market system right, what is the potential? Mm -hmm.